Folks, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. In society today, a lot of people perceive music as a musician's gift to the world. So you have this malarkey out there, quote, Oh, you can pay to play, or you can play for the door. In contrast, my elders lived music as a profession, and there were places to sit in. That love doesn't exist right now because there's not enough work to go around. There are no intellectual property rights and no studio scene. That lack of freedom, opportunity, and justice and, re- and the restriction of music on the radio all hurt open-mindedness and advancement in society. I'm all in for the musicians as we slowly move forward after a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. Spiritual live music is a healing force that can bridge humanity's gaps by touching hearts and souls. Every time I've gone to a concert in the last couple of years, I have brought that voltage to the bandstand from minute one because I want the cats to get out of their thinking mind. You get that crowd activation, and the next thing you know, through that intensity, you're getting the musicians off. That's a spiritual experience, raising the collective consciousness. The cats then revitalize my spirit and get the creative juices flowing again so I can let the body dance. Billy Earhart, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, Jake. Thanks for having me, man. So good to hear you, man. It's so it's such an honor to connect with you originally. I had such a ball the first time. You know, I, I do want to ask you from your perspective, um, you got a gig tonight, you know, and, you know, you got to sing for your supper, but can you just talk about how you feel the significance of music has changed in our culture? And what I mean by that is, um, you know, just the, the idea of, what album, like a a concept album, used to mean just to regular people and how much music dictated sort of our culture, whereas now so many places, like I just talked about in my intro, you know, I can go in completely fanaticized and I'm told like oftentimes to sit down or to move. I'm blocking people's view because I'm dancing or getting off and it's like, this isn't a classical concert. Music is made for dancing. It's weird, man. It's a weird time, and I wanted you to talk about your own experiences, how you feel how music, this, the significance of music has changed in our culture. Oh, man. I, I don't know what to say about that. I, you know, I'm just kind of wrapped up down here in Mississippi the last 25 years, hanging on, uh, picking and grinning occasionally. (laughs) And uh, I don't actually go anywhere else at all. Right. Uh, I go to my daughter's house and watch her grandbabies. I watch my grandbabies. I got four of them. And uh, do a show every now and then and do some recording and um do you, so okay so so you're in your kind of own uh, i don't want to say bubble but you you just regional situation um but like when you go out what is still inspiring to you about going out and playing live gigs and what i mean by that is like you know At your age, you've been around, you have clearly done your time on the bandstand, you've had a good time, you've made hit records, you've toured the world. Um, Is it the only thing... I just turned 69 just last week. I mean, you're not that old. I'm sorry, you're just a young buck. But uh, what is still the spiritual motivation for Billy Earhart to go and drive over an hour to play gigs? Well, it's the only thing I've ever done, Jake. I, I, you know, when you get get into playing shows and that feeling of of uh, playing a, a song that that goes over nicely or sounds good to you, maybe the crowd didn't really they're not paying attention, you know, in this restaurant or wherever. But it felt great to you and. I think just the uh, spiritual part of the music, 
keeps me going after it, you know, and doing it. I've been playing 55 years. I, <clears throat> I was 12 when I did my first show, but, you know, since, since about 1970, I've been steadily playing. Um, and, uh, actually, you know, they're not quite as wild now as they were back in the 60s or 70s. What do you mean, what do you mean by that? Well, um, down in the South, you know, there used to be honky-tonks in every town, on the outskirts of town, everywhere, mm. all in the South. Mm. And a bunch of those have shut down. But, uh, I mean, I lived in Muscle Shoals a couple of years and played in a house band at this one place. Um, before the Amazing Rhythm Aces, there was a band that was uh, Tolly Lee and Annabelle. And, I mean, there'd be four or 500 people every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. Wow. And they were drinking like maniacs, <laughs> taking quaaludes. Dude, snorting, it was a you know. madhouse, dude. It was, uh, it was a, a huge party going on, people fighting. It's just, it seemed like they were more wild back then. And then they, they really, uh, clamp down on the drinking and driving in the south there you're darn many, right dude people, the mothers against yeah, drunk driving absolutely yeah they were there were so many people getting killed yeah. and they clamped down on that that people don't go out in the masses like they used to so much you know maybe on the west coast or in some big huge cities atlanta or memphis uh but down here in North Mississippi, it's no. I want to be very like clear, that. man. It's you are. It's indicative of. <clears throat> I was just in Atlanta, and you don't even want to be driving around on the streets of downtown Atlanta. I mean, there's. It's like a police state. Um, they. I, I wonder though. Were you expected in Annabelle in that group to play till? I mean, I know that in some places, like in the some of the clubs. In the West Coast, in those in that era, they'd stopped serving alcohol around two, but the cl the music never stopped. I mean, you might play till dawn. I mean, were you were you on the bandstand till like four or five in the morning? Not at at uh, at that time, but I did uh, play in a blues band in Memphis there a couple of years later. Uh, with uh, Papa Don McMahon and the Memphis Blues Review, wow. and we were playing at the old Ritz Theater, and they had, uh, uh, I think we started at two. We played from two to five in the morning. Wow. It was for the late night crowd. Wow. That was in the uh, early 80s, and it was... Uh, Massive amounts of uh, cocaine everywhere, all over the world. I don't know why, but it, it was. It was insane. It was. It was out. It's. I mean, I was a, a, just a wee kid at that time, but man, it was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. People were up all night, and uh, I don't think they could serve, but you could bring your own bottle in some of these places. A after two, you know, but, uh, uh, how would you, <clears throat> I'm just curious how you could talk about like, um, you know, you, you, that I, I like what you said before, uh, you know, I, I feel like so much of, I remember talking to David Spinoza, a great studio guitar player and, uh, incredible musician. And he just talked about, um, at a certain point, I mean, they were like, we have to make music as background music for people to have conversations over. And right. it was like, you know, 
this is a sacred experience. I mean, music is a sacred experience. And this idea that somehow you're interrupting people's conversations, you can't play too loud or, uh, you know, to me, that's the ultimate disrespect. I was just wondering if you could talk, maybe not you as a band leader, but did you work with cats uh, that uh, imposed their spirit and will on the crowd and got them into the music? Maybe they weren't paying attention at first, but then they got hooked. Uh, I can't think of any anybody that changed the deal. If it was if, if it was a restaurant and you had to play soft because people were bringing their girlfriends or wives in and they wanted to talk and they don't want it real super loud and they're so the waitresses don't have to scream and can't get the orders and it's everything but the it's everything but the music right i mean that's just like but i'm I'm, i guess more to the point like you know whether it was the black artists that you were with i mean or russell like you know and you were in a place and you know sometimes you're in a a sports bar nobody and people could care less whether you're there or not but i'm just talking about the ability of, uh, you know, to really lock, p- get people to lock into the music, maybe more of a concert setting. Um, I just can't tell you, Billy, how many times, uh, y- you know, like I need to be up at the front of the bandstand where I'm getting the stage sound and the natural vibration of love coming from the musicians. And I want to be able to let the body dance. And I just, it's dan- a lot. I'm not talking about a classical music concert. I'm talking about music that you're that is meant to move your body. And the amount of times that people come up and be like, uh, you know, you're blocking my view. I'm like, well, if you can walk, why don't you move out of the, why don't you move so you can see that? I mean, I, I, we've gotten to this point of pacification with the music and it's just, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just saying, I wonder from your point of view, um, you know, if you if you noticed the point in your career where all of a sudden it, you were l- like least prioritized this, in terms of the the music and the band itself, uh, not so much. A couple of times, I one time we played over in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, for a couple of years with my buddy uh, uh, Anthony Zappa. He used to work with George Jones, and I played with Hank Jr., so they want old country stuff. But they want it soft. We did that for a few years at a place, and ah, it was okay. I mean, some things you feel like you could wish you could crank it up a little bit more, but (laughs) you don't want to push the limit with these club owners uh well it's a gig you want to get you want to get yeah you need you need the dough yeah you, know? you don't want to get fired for being too loud and even though these guys may be right on the borderline of being an asshole you still want to go ahead and please them so you have the job i you do know, if it's every week but uh yeah i haven't had to deal with that too much like when i was uh without green uh, for a year and a half in the mid-'85 80, and 86, 84 and 85. Um, it was when he was doing Full Tilt Gospel. And uh, if it was a concert, hmm. like we played the Beverly Theater and Beverly Hills out in California. Sure. And, you know, the people at a uh, Al Green show, they're going to get up and move around. <laughs> uh, and same thing with Hank Jr. You know, the people are standing up, the girls are pulling their shirts off, <laughs> uh, pulling their bras up. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, stage. right, right. I mean, these hillbillies are wild out there. <laughs> but, uh, 
Well, so 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 was that? He's I mean, not going to compromise. He wouldn't. He's one of the ones that this is what you get. We ain't cutting it down. You know, they've had some level things out in California where they take a meter and they check how many decibels you are. That's right. And you have to stay within the line and, oh, he don't like that. But, uh... Was that, because Al was singing, like, he was preaching and, uh, or, you know, he was doing the gospel thing. I mean, some of the crowd, based on his earlier high records, which were much more like, you know, sensual and, like you said, they're taking their shirts off. I mean, was he... Because he was, because he was trying to be staying on the righteous path, was he like? Did he have to like, you know, reel people in and say this, this is not God, this is not godly stuff. Taking you know, taking your clothes off and throwing your bras on stage was. Well, that now that was the Hank Junior shows, but uh, Al's they they didn't get that wild because they knew he was playing gospel music. But they would definitely move around at Al's shows if it was a concert. And, um, but uh, the Hank Williams Jr. shows were definitely wild as you could imagine. (laughs) I cannot believe that. I mean, just to talk about your gig tonight. I mean, what is, aside from the dough... What makes you feel good after a concert? After because you've been doing it. I mean, again, it's like you know, it's like going and riding your bike every day since you were twelve years old. I mean, you've been literally doing this for decades. But what's something that like still touches your heart at a show that you're going to play tonight? Well, it's the songs. I, I'd say you know that they. Hit me in the heart pretty good. Uh, we play a nice variety of stuff. It's uh, Zap and Billy E. That's what we go by. And we play. I got about three or four little bands around Mississippi I work with. Hmm. But this uh, this guy used to play with George Jones. And he knows a bunch of good old country uh Waylon and a lot of Merle Haggard and some Hank Williams Sr. and just uh, tremendous songs, you know. The material's great. And, uh, you know, it's uh, Buck's Barbecue. It's not any kind of big concert. You know, it's kind of like a honky tonk barbecue. Well, that's my kind of deal. I don't want a big concert hall anyway. I want to get greasy. But I mean, are there kids there? Are I mean, I, I say I've I, never been. I've never been there. Uh, this will be our. First oh, time. what maiden voyage for Earhart tonight? Wow. Wow. Yeah, I'm excited about going over there and doing that. Well, that's then that's a great reason. That just the first time to check it out. You know, maybe people <laughs> when you talk about the honky tonks whether in Muscle Shoals or in the South, why were they on the outskirts of town? Well, the reason the one that we played at was they didn't have any kind of drinking laws in Muscle Shoals. Um, You couldn't buy a beer. It was illegal. That's incredible. And no liquor stores, no beer. And so you had to go just on the outskirts of town, uh, Muscle Shoals and Florence and Tishomingo and Sheffield. It's a quad cities, and they're right there almost on the Tennessee line. It's about 12 or 13 miles just outside of town. So on, at the Tennessee line up there, you could buy beer. So that was uh, part of the attraction. It, that all's changed. That was 50 years ago. No, but so what you're saying is it was bring your own beer so they could buy the beer, and because the, the honky-tonk was close to the border, they could, br- they could drink 
they could bring that beer to the, to the honky tonk. No, they had, they had beer at the honky tonk in Tennessee, wow. but in, um, Alabama, you right here in that county, you couldn't drink. Wow! You, know, you could go, you could go uh, fifty miles over to Huntsville, Alabama, and get a drink. But right but but basically, but you're what you're saying is that those hundreds of people that would show up Thursday, Friday, Saturday night uh, were just basically uh, smuggling in their own alcohol, or just having drinking quaaludes, or I mean, just taking quaaludes. They were doing everything. They were bringing liquor. Yeah, they were, but there was no, but there was no, there was no beer or liquor sold at that honky tonk that you played at. They brought it in themselves. No, they had, they could sell it at the honky tonk because they were in Tennessee. You couldn't buy it back in Muscle Shoals. Uh, okay, so actually, the the honky tonk that you played at with that band was in Tennessee, not Alabama. Yeah, we lived in Alabama. It's just right on the line, you know. You go across the state line, and things change. It's just, you know, ten minutes out of Muscle Shoals. So that's wild. I mean, okay, I'm going to ask you uh, about a couple people here. Just, you know, so many of these um, titans of different types of music, um, you know, they've lived these very hardy lives, but we lost a couple of, of cats, and I'm not saying that you ran into them or played with them, but I just was going to ask you about, uh, the first guy was Wayne Shorter. Yeah, what a great sax player. I, I loved uh, his playing with uh, Miles Davis and Weather Report. You know, part of me wants to believe in a dream that, Billy Earhart and the Amazing Rhythm Aces somehow wound up on some crazy bill with Weather Report. Did you see them live ever? No, I never did. I had some buddies that knew uh, Jocko Pastorius, the bass player. Really? Yeah, he used to play with Wayne Cochran. Absolutely, dude. That was his original gig. Yeah, and they knew him from... from, uh, uh, down when he was down in down in Florida with uh, <laughs> Wayne Cochran, wow. and uh, but I never did get to hear him. I always wanted to, but we were just so busy in the seventies, eighties, and nineties that I just never got a chance to. I would have loved to have gone to hear him, and he's just an incredible. It was a couple of guys died uh, of friends of mine. Uh, great bass player uh, uh, in Nashville. Uh, uh, my mind went blank. Uh, please Michael. don't. Please do not say Norbert Putnam. No. Um, Well, it'll come. To, it'll come to you. I, I there. I mean, uh, you know, the other cat I wanted to talk to you about. Um, he's kind of unheralded, but he was a total shaman, uh, and I'm so grateful that we did four interviews together. It was a guy named David Lindley. Did you ever cross paths? Oh with yeah, him? I loved him. I never did get to meet him or hear him live, but. Um, I love everything he did. <laughs> Jackson Brown. Yeah, man. El Rey Oeg. Exactly, dude. I mean, you, you are like a... So you're... I just want to be clear. I mean, when you guys had time off this, with the Aces, either you were recording or just chilling out and trying to recalibrate from the road, it wasn't like you were, you know... Uh, consuming a lot of live music. I mean, you know, part of me, like, feels like, uh, you know, just because we talked about the significance of live music, that, you know, if you were out in California uh, and you had a day off or something, you could roll into the Troubadour or, you know, who who knows who would be playing. I mean, uh, but you never got a chance to really 
Um, I mean, to me, I never, <coughs> I never saw these guys live either, but, um, you would say that for the most part, you weren't somebody who was checking out a lot of live music when you had downtime. Well, I, I used to, uh, before I got sober, that was, uh, 93, but, uh, all through the seventies and eighties, if we had downtime, uh, we'd go check people out, um, go to clubs, go to bars, go to concerts and stuff, but not so much anymore. But um, Were there any memorable, like, unknown bands that turned into huge acts, that, but you saw them when they were just totally unknown? Oh, yeah, I saw Robert Cray and his band oh before they ever God. had a record out. Oh, my God. Wait, how did that happen? I was on tour with Al Green out in California, and uh, we had a night off, and we went to a club, and there they were playing. And uh, next thing you know, they've got an album out, <laughs> getting a little promotion. They're touring all over the South. That was kind of cool. Uh I got to see Tower of Power one time on a night off. Oh my! Wait, wait, hold on, wait a minute. Where this? This is fa- I I love those cats. I know a lot of them personally. Uh, you saw them in Oakland, or where? Where were they playing? Do you remember? Uh, this was. Uh, it was in the Bay Area. I'm, I can't remember exactly where it was. Um. I don't think it was in Oakland, but it was somewhere around in the Interesting, Bay Area. interesting, interesting. This is fascinating stuff. The point is that, <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, I got this, uh, um, <clears throat> this comment, you know, our interview and some of the transcriptions that I did really, uh, pleasantly stirred some of the, uh, the, the dirt that might have been kind of, We've sort of been recalibrating a little bit of that dirt and uh, turning it over and toiling it. And this guy, Artie Cameron, um, does that name ring a bell to you? R.D. Cameron? Yeah. Or Artie? Like R.D. Cameron. He said he said he was... No, t- I don't think so. He, I'm just, you know, th- I'm just wondering about some of these cats. Like, he wrote... He wrote this interview because I was uh, I was tasked with putting together the Muscle Shoals All Star Band. I know you weren't part of. It. He said Russell Levon, James Hooker, Randall Bramlett, uh, Michael Chapman, and a drummer Milton Sledge. Um, and he just said that he goes he was Duncan Cameron on guitar. Dunk. He was an ace too. Yeah, no. So, R, so he's going on uh, his YouTube account is R D. So Duncan Cameron, that's who it is, and myself, Duncan Cameron from the Aces Muscle Shoals Rhythm Section, section, and later Sawyer Brown. Uh, right. And he, he yeah, said, that's my buddy Duncan. I just talked to him on the phone the other day. Okay, so when talk about how you connected? When did Duncan come into the mix with the with the Aces? He came into the mix in uh, 78. Um, Our uh, producer and guitar player, electric guitar, and they played steel and dobro. Bird, 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 Burden? Is it Bird? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he, it was the anniversary of his death today. Are you kidding me? Well, I mean, let's celebrate. I am so honored to be talking to you on Bird's birthday, man. It's not his birthday. It's I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the day of. Well, then. Yeah. Either way, he's looking. Yeah, he died on March 10th, 15 years ago. He left. Uh, him and Russell had a little issue. Anyway, he left, and immediately we got Duncan. Duncan had been. A, he was a L.A. boy, and he had been playing at the Palomino out there. Sure. <clears throat> Some with the house band. 
and um, somehow he got a little gig with uh, Hugh Hefner's wife, Barbie Benton, at the time. I've seen records by Barbie, yeah, totally, on Playboy Records, uh, unbelievable. He might have played on a few of them, but he was, she had some concerts, like in Japan or somewhere. Right. They'd get a big concert for, you know, 25, 50 grand, and it was uh, easy money for her to go out there and do a little hour, and uh, of course she was keeping most of the money, but... Anyway, they used to rehearse at the Playboy Mansion. He said that was pretty cool. Hey, this anyway, is what this is what he said. This he, is yeah. Go ahead, continue. He he came into the the picture uh, just within days. We he was going to be our guitar player, and uh, turned out he played everything that Bird played. And uh, he came in on our fifth album, and he did uh, the fifth album, sixth album, seventh and eighth. Then we took a little 14-year break while Russell was doing solo stuff and writing a bunch in Nashville. And then we got together. They didn't even have CDs back in, in the early part of Ace's days, but Russell said, let's get together and use all the original guys and let's just like do some greatest hits or something. We, so we did a CD Duncan played on that. I, I'm curious about. I'm curious about though, how you guys knew Duncan would just fit in like, like not like you guys knew him before, or how did that? No, we didn't know him before. I don't know how in the hell we got a hold of him already. <laughs> yeah, I'm, you should ask him next time you talk. Next time you talk to him, you should ask him. You know. <laughs> yeah, nobody knew him. But he was a really nice guy, and he fit in real good. He, I was the youngest one for a long time. Then, then all of a sudden, he's the youngest one. He was a couple of years younger sure, than me. Sure, sure. Everybody else was five, eight years older than me. Uh, Russell and Stick, they were five years older. James, six years older. But... Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't know that he had a Facebook page. It was R. D. Cameron? YouTube, YouTube. He, I, I, my, my interview with Russell is on YouTube, and he wrote a very. He, this is what he said, and I just want you to riff on it. I, I know you're probably going to agree, but <clears throat> he said. Uh, <clears throat> So he he was doing tour managing for the Muscle Shoals All Stars when when Russell decided to do his own solo stuff. He, but he said Russell was as soulful and as intelligent a human as I ever knew. He was a, he his was a frustrating life with many highs and lows. The Aces was the best band I was ever in, and Russ was one of the best writers and singers ever. A master of Americana before it was a term, and a vocal range that was inhuman. He refused to be pigeonholed. Go listen to Give Me My Flowers While I'm Living, probably the last tune we recorded in the Amazing Rhythm Aces. It fits. God bless and rest easy, pal. Um, were you aware of the, I mean, <sighs> did he live a, did he, was Russell able to stop and smell the roses or was he on such a, a different frequency level that um, the highs were so high and the lows were really low and it was hard to relate to his situation. Uh, uh, he had a couple of tough things happen. His wife he had some issues. Um, but, uh, 
you know, he was a pretty tough guy. He, 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 you'd really never know anything was wrong most of the time. Sometimes he'd be a little grouchy, you know, but wasn't too bad. <laughs> uh, he'd just fight on through whatever it was, you know. Um, yeah, he had to end up raising his two boys by himself. His wife left him, but uh, she, uh, she, I don't really want to talk bad about no, her. No, 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 you don't know, you, it's, it's okay, I mean, the point. She's been dead 20 years ago, she had cancer, and I think she wanted to go ahead and get out of the picture, I think she might have known she had cancer, actually, I don't know. Uh, was the you know you say he was Russell was a tough cat, but you know because you would never really know if someone was bothering him or not. But did did you feel like you were the youngest cat in the band? But was he did he inspire you as as a player? I mean, in terms of you know just showing up on a nightly basis, or and was he <clears throat> somebody that that was an inspiration to you? He was inspirational in the songs that he he wrote were, uh, I think, they're pretty soulful and have a nice story and you know a, a simple, easy to digest flavor to them. You know, not too complicated, right? But but soulful nevertheless oh, man, and you just want to listen to him over and over it makes you feel good you know yeah it was fun doing that job I did it 47 years with that little 14 year break in the middle but <clears throat> yeah we did 25 albums with Amazing Rhythm that Rhythm. is insane that you know I wanted to ask you a question I've talked to a couple cats <laughs> one of them was uh Chris Parker, a uh, great drummer, the original drummer in Stuff. Do you remember? Do you, did you know that band Stuff out of New York? Gordon Edwards, Richard T, sure. Cornell Dupree. So one day, Parker, Chris Parker is down in uh, New Orleans working on an Alan Toussaint record, and uh, the guy he was sharing the Holiday Inn with got had pneumonia, and. Uh, so on the way back to the airport, uh, Chris could feel him. He, he he could just feel his body just deteriorating. He was not feeling good. He never felt that sick in his life. <laughs> and uh, uh, Stuff had a gig that night. Uh, Chris had brought Steve Gadd into the band. And Chris was like, I am not going to miss this gig. I can't miss. This is going to be just insane. I can't miss it. Everyone's saying, you got to go to the hospital, man. Please, you know, you're really sick. <clears throat> and of course he goes to the gig they play and all he was focused on was like trying to get through the gig and get into bed but he was so sort of out of body that when he finished the gig uh the fan the the, the customers the fans were coming up to him saying dude what it got into you tonight. We've never heard you play that way. That was out of control. You were out of your mind. That was amazing. And I just, you know, so I've talked to people who with fatigue or sickness, uh, actually, because all you're doing is trying to survive, you wind up playing the best you've ever played in your life. I just wonder if you have an experience. I mean, being that you've been on the road for so many years, if you had a similar experience where, you had really no business being on the bandstand. You were really ill, but you, it, it, it's something just, you know, you wound up up there and you, something else took over and you just killed the gig. I, I never have had to deal with that. Uh, when Russell died in uh, 2019, it's been four years ago, we did a show... Uh, and Muscle Shoals over at, uh, it used to be Muscle Shoals Sound Studios, number two on the river. Right. Uh, now it's Cypress Moon, but we, they have a concert hall. It used to be a, uh, like a big, uh, National Guard building 
or something. They turned it into like two or three studios, wow. a bunch of offices, and a, a big concert hall room in there. That was uh, the last Aces show. And Russell, he didn't even seem like he was sick. And he may have known he had throat cancer and not said anything because he didn't say anything all the way through till he died. He didn't tell any band member. He didn't even tell his son. Wow. That was uh, like a guy just uh, recently died after uh, David Lindley and Wayne Shorter, a Nashville studio legend. Well, you can't keep throwing this around without dropping a name. You can't remember the name right now? I, I, I'm surprised I'm not even aware of it. Uh, God, I can't remember his last name. What's his first name? Michael Rhodes. That's it, Michael Rhodes. Michael Rhodes? I don't know that. Michael Rhodes died wow. just three days ago. Holy shit. Okay, he was uh, like the number one studio bass player in Nashville. He played on thousands of records. Wow. He toured with Steve Winwood. He toured with Rodney Crowell and toured with uh, Joe Bonamassa the last 15 years. I'm looking at him right here, his Facebook profile here. Yeah, Michael Rhodes. Unbelievable. Yeah, he 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 died of pancreatic cancer and the same thing. He didn't say shit to anybody. I mean, his wife and family probably knew. But uh, he was working and just up to the bitter end. And finally, when he couldn't do it anymore, they said he went home and just sat in a big recliner and listened to John Coltrane records. Jesus. And he just went out that way. But, uh... You think it... <laughs> you, 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 you think that... Well, this is more psychological, but would you have wanted to know that Russell was sick, or did that really... was Because, I mean, obviously it was not just... Uh, well, I would have liked to have been able to tell him I loved him before uh, right. he, he checked out. And thank you for, you know, all the years of traveling all over the world, every state, the USA, all over Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Did you go to Japan? I went there with Hank Williams Jr., but not Aces didn't go. Aces didn't go to uh, Japan. Yeah. We went to Norway, went to uh, Sweden, Denmark, uh, England, Ireland, uh, just all over. I just want to wish I could have thanked him for all that, but he he didn't want to get a bunch of pity. Um, I don't blame. I, I I honestly understand. I mean, I'm forty, I mean, forty five next week, but I understand that to a degree. I mean, not telling your family. I don't know about that, but I, I'm just you know you, you're right. It it takes on this this whole other added sense of pressure, and it's almost like I don't know. I I I, I get well, well, aside from traveling the world, um, because. You put this stuff out in the ether, it's, I mean, he's going to hear it. Um, why else did you love Russell Smith? Well, it was just uh, when you work with somebody, you know, a ton of years, and you've had great times for that long you just you know you just uh, appreciate them and they inspire you and you love them and like a brother you know right. just uh, uh, it was all about the music with me and Russell you know 
and uh, maybe an occasional left-handed cigarette. But... <laughs> <laughs> so you're what you're saying is like you weren't like uh, when you say it was all about the music. I mean, um, you still see um, just from those that prolific amount of that catalog. Guys like Jim Morrison from The Doors was like, I don't know how to write a song, so we're all going to be credited as songwriters. John Densmore, Robbie Krieger, Ray Manzarek. So all those cats got uh, publishing credits and still see those checks today. I mean, are you still seeing uh, royalties from the, the music that you worked on with Russell? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Digital royalties, yeah. Uh, not none of the songs, you know. But, when you say uh, did, when you say digital royalties, what does that mean? Uh, there's an organization that collects digital royalties for people. Sound Exchange. You've got to sign up for it, and <clears throat> so if you, if your stuff winds if if if, if Amazing Rhythm Aces stuff winds up on Spotify or uh, some sort of different digital platform. You'll get some cr royalty for that. It's uh, I think it's mainly for like digital radio. Interesting. Stuff. Interesting. Uh, they collect not not for sales or. Uh, for not publishing for the songs. It's just uh, like being on digital radio shows that are online, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. You get, they're not huge, you know, a few hundred bucks, three or four hundred sometimes. But that all goes somewhere good, you know. I mean, that... Comes comes in handy every Absolutely, time. man. I mean, we all kind of... 50 years back, you're thinking, wow, <laughs> that's pretty nice. I mean, does it surprise you? <laughs> I mean, do you feel like... Uh, I just, you know, I feel like... Uh, um, this, this younger cat, I was transcribing this interview the other day, and he was just talking about why he became a musician and... A lot of it had to do, he said, with these jazz musicians, the old school guys who were just searching for this endless note. It would, it, it was, there was never any point of arrival. There was no arriving. It was just this constant search for sound, and it was an on, it was an ongoing, forever journey. And I wonder, even though you're playing iconic cover tunes that are still deep and soulful at Buck's Barbecue tonight and stuff like that. Do you still, do you feel that music is the forever journey? Are you, I mean, is it still, like, there's no, there's never been an arriving for Billy Earhart. Yeah, that's pretty much the way it is for any musician. It's a, it's a, it's a lifetime trip to figure out how to play and how to play the right thing and how to, not play anything and uh you know it's 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 a journey that uh you know you you never can say well i've i'm uh i'm finished <laughs> I, I i know everything it's 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 too much to learn it, it takes forever to even get close so hey i'm constantly learning can you talk about a couple things that you're working on right now that you're trying to keep shit like that, or even just stuff that cosmically just sort of dropped into your lap. You're like, I didn't even know that. I'm just curious about a couple of specific things that you've learned in your recent past. Uh, just, uh, well, I'll tell you one thing that's kind of helped me. It's not so much of a specific, uh, thing but because there's so much on youtube so much music <laughs> yeah and i'm a i'm a maniac for like 
twenties, thirties, forties, and fifties stuff. I love it. So I'm all the time listening, and uh, hearing tunes that you know, if you had, if you went to try to find the '78, it'd probably cost you about five grand, twenty five hundred or something. And it's right here on YouTube. Uh, that's right. Free. That's right. That's right. So it, um, your ears are getting constantly getting bigger and bigger, just listening to be able to hear the all this these tunes from different. Yeah, and learning, you know, how to do uh, improve on like ragtime piano styles Dang. or more different jazz stylings on a B three organ. You know, uh, you get to hear tons of B three players that. You, never heard of, you know, that are killing it, and uh, piano players, too, you know. Killing it, just killing it, yeah. Did you ever talk, <clears throat> did you ever talk to Mike Finnegan? You know, it's, it just brings a tear to my eye, man. My, Mike was, I'm going to send you, I did a couple interviews over the phone like this, but I'm going to send you my in-person interview with him at his home. Um, the man, and he's actually all of our interviews have been transcribed, and my fifth book is about to be published, and he's in it. And I'm so glad that you brought him up, man. Because is that the one where he's playing piano? Yes. Okay, I've I've saw that. Man. You, how beautiful was that. that, man? How beautiful was that? Just incredible. Incredible, man. man. I, that and dude, that was. That broke me open, man. I mean, it, like the guy. Did you know him when he was with the Surfs, or I mean, when did you even? Because that dude was, he was in Kansas, but I mean, then he went out. I, with, I didn't know him personally, but I've just been a fan. <clears throat> he went to Muscle Shoals and did a record. You're darn right, he did. Jerry Wexler and, produced that, yeah. And uh, you know, and then he played with. Uh, and Bonnie Ray, Steve Stills, Steven and Bonnie Stil Ray, right, that's right. And James, Crosby, Joe Stills, Conner. and Nash, that's right. Yeah, just tons of them. And the Phantom Blues Band back in Taj Mahal. Oh my God, dude! My favorite people. I've just people. been a fan of so much stuff he's done that I felt like I knew him. You know, and I talked to him on Facebook every now and then before he died a couple of years ago, but. I love Mike uh, Finnegan. Just a beautiful soul, man. Well, just so were you, man. Player. I mean, I, I feel like in yeah, I feel like in some ways when I saw your profile pop up on Facebook, I was like, you know, Mike continues to guide me in his own way. Um, and I was singer too, man. Oh we're my, boys. dude, no, because that was the thing. There was a club <clears throat> in. Uh, up real about forty five minutes outside L A called uh, the Write Off Room, and his buddy Bill Lynch, who was a guitar player in Kansas with Mike growing up, had the, he owned a club, and I got to see more than half a dozen times live, like front row in a small little club bistro, James Gadsden on drums, Mike Finnegan on organ. Abe Laboriel on bass and Bill Lynch on guitar. It was, I'll send you wow. some of, it was, so I, I, I am totally at peace with, I miss Mike so much, but man, I'm going to say he was doing Johnny guitar Watson tunes. He was doing Mose Allison tunes. It was ridiculous. I, oh yeah. He had great taste. Uh, and I, I, he did the hell out of, uh, uh, Ray Charles. Oh my! Exactly. He could, she could just play and sing. Just what I love so much. I just I love him. Well, I want to tell you something, Billy. I, I much love to you, man. I, I, I you know, I, when you go to the gig tonight, plays play a tune for Mike Finnegan, man. And uh, and I really hope that at a certain point, I can get down and come catch a hang with you and see you play a couple of gigs. You know. Well, I'd love to hang with you, man, and I, I appreciate you letting me be part of this thing. And uh, I think it's fantastic because I can already see people commenting about stories they weren't aware of. 
some of this stuff is just like breathe, you know, you you breathe life back into something, and all of a sudden it just takes on a life of its own. So in 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 so many ways, you know, it's like, and I think what Lindley was talking to me about was just. It's still hard for me to get my head around it, but it it, does, it is all music. At the end of the day, it really is all music, and the labeling and the genres, and I mean that's good for marketing, but it is all music, and you know you're part of that lexicon. So, uh, yeah, it's just been it's it's been great. We just breeze through another hour here, and uh, yeah, man, my pleasure. I I really enjoyed it, and just. Uh, Anytime I'm happy out, let me know. Let me ask you, uh, can you connect me with, with Stick? Yeah, I sure can. All right, cool. Let me know how to how to reach him. I, you know, I just got to you know keep chopping wood here, you know. But maybe when you get back this weekend, uh, you know, just let me know how to get a hold of him. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Uh, he's... Uh, He's down Tampa, St. Pete area. I can't. I'm just so on. I can't believe how much older he is than you. Uh, that he's yeah. A, he's uh, he's about seventy three, I think seventy four. And I'm just so glad he's still here because Butch is gone. Russell's. I mean, I have you listened to my interview with Russell? I think you get a real kick out of that. Um, I'll send it. I'll send it to you again, and I'll send you some of the Finnegan stuff too, man. You'll really dig that. Yeah, I need to listen to uh, the Willie Hall and Russell thing again. It's still on there. All I got to do is scroll up. Hey, man, you're a YouTube fan. I think I sent you the YouTube link, so you're good to go. You, they're always there, baby. But those are those were those are some of the best interviews. I just I love, I love the, I love you guys, and uh, and I, I mean I'm, I'm on a you know this is the forever journey for me too, man. So. Anyway, I'll reach out to you. Are you going to get back tonight, or you'll be back this weekend? or? Yeah, I'm just doing tonight. I'll be back, you know, before midnight, so it ain't no big thing. Just a couple of hours playing some country and some blues, and come on home. All right, baby. Well, we'll be in touch this weekend, man, and uh, I'll get this up tonight. And be safe on the road and have a ball. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you, Billy. Much love, babe. All right, brother. Thank you. Be cool. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.